thank you all for coming out. At 7 o'clock, we'd like to start on time so that everybody gets an opportunity to speak as much as we possibly can. Uh, I appreciate you coming out to our first town hall meeting of 2016. We had four last year. We're planning on having four again this year. Um, I'm not going to give a, a speech ahead of time. I want to answer questions and, and, and try to give as many responses as I can. But I do want to acknowledge some people in the room. I see Phyllis Madachi is here, who's our Director of Citizen Services. Thank you. So if we have any questions dealing with human services, she can answer those. Larry Tweels here, our Director of Economic Development Authority is here. I know that John Bird from Recreation and Parks is on his way. He had to be in Annapolis earlier. Um, so if we have any questions in those areas, they certainly can hear, be here to help. Uh, we also have a lot of folks who are on staff with our office here tonight, so they're taking notes. Uh, there quite easily could be questions that I don't have answers for tonight, and we will certainly write those down and get back to you. Uh, so no fear about that. Of course, this is being videotaped, and we put that on a website so people can watch us even if they're not available to come uh, at the, the night of the town hall. I do notice that there is at least one elected official here. Ellen Flynn Giles is here from the Board of Education. Uh, thank her for coming. I know she's also a candidate. Also, David Myers is here, probably representing Delegate Bob Flanagan. And there are some candidates for Board of Education. I don't know all of them here, but if you want to stand up and at least introduce yourself so people know you're here. I know Vicki is here. Do you want to stand up? Just... Hi, I'm Vicki Catania, running for Board of Ed. Anyone else who's running for Board of Ed? I thought some over. Yeah. Corey Andrews, David Eldridge. Kirsten Jones. Okay, I just want to make sure that everybody who was running, I appreciate you all coming out tonight. So um, with that, uh, no pre preamble for me. Anybody who wants to speak, please come forward. Uh, please keep your uh, questions or comments uh, short as possible just because we want more people to be able to speak. Uh, I do see these events as much a listening time for me as a responding time for me. Uh, and again, as I said, if there's something I can't answer tonight, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So uh, I'm here to listen. And who wants to go first? Yes, sir. Come on up. And if anyone else wants to go up, that's fine, too. All right. Is it working? Is it working? Oh, we caught him off guard. Oh. All right. Um, good evening. I just want to say thank you for letting me come up here. And, um, and listen, um, just like you, I grew up in Howard County, Maryland. Um, I moved here when I was 10. I'm from St. Mary's County, Maryland. Um, last year, I started a nonprofit called The Fourth Quarter. I went to Elk Ridge Lane Middle School, and, and then I went to Howard High School after that played sports through in the, throughout the county, and then got to kind of see how things happened through the middle school ages as well as the high school ages. Um, this past year, we helped create 27 future leaders in the community, and we're currently at Bonnie Branch and Elk Ridge Landing Middle School. Um, it's a situation where we have about 75 community members helping us out right now to make this thing happen. Coach Strunk from the Howard High football team is on our board of directors. We have business owners, and we also have people who really want to solve these problems. Four problems we're looking to solve are experimentation with drugs and alcohol, childhood obesity, lack of focus in the classroom, and failing to reach one's true leadership potential. And through growing up in the county, I saw numerous friends who went down that wrong path in school, got addicted to drugs, alcohol, and I've seen teammates over these last five years pass away. And um, the reason what we, did, what we decided to do is start this after school program to give kids something proactive to do after school. It's a situation where they're learning how to be leaders and take action instead of just listening and not, you know, being able to act on their decisions. Um, so the question I have is, how can we work with the Howard County community and Howard County Recreation and Parks to make this come, you know, come to fruition and help these, help these problems be stopped? Um, we're currently working with Doug Duvall as well, um, a few other people in the county, and something has to be done. So I guess. What is your stance on solving those four problems and how should we go about doing it? Okay, well, I appreciate it. I, I know I was trying to hear everything else in the four problems, but um, I think that when you talk about leadership, first of all, thank you for doing it more than anything else. Thank you for being proactive and trying to make a difference for yourself. And uh, I certainly can understand why you're doing it because you've been here since you're 10 years old. Um, I, I think the best thing we can do is the, the way to help your organization to be more active, I think it's also to work with the school system perhaps. I know that Ellen Flynn Giles back there and the other members who are people running for the school, school board, it certainly would be a, a good connection I would think because that's the way you can reach a lot of the young people. And then uh, John Bird's going to be here from Recreation and Parks. If you provide me your contact information in case you're not here, I can certainly connect you with him to try to figure out how to make it happen. But I think the best way we can do is to be able to have pro partnerships with the county to see how we can assist you in reaching out to individuals. Uh, we also have HC Drug Free. 
uh, which um, has done a lot of work in Howard County trying to deal with uh, kids who are, are dealing with that issue, but also trying to figure out ways in which to prevent the access of drugs to young people, uh, which I think is one of the bigger issues, getting prescription drugs from their family members or other folks, which is kind of what gets them started into much worse things. And you're right, we have a serious heroin problem in Howard County, just like we do everywhere else in Maryland. So I think between HD Drug Free, the Recreation Parks Department, working with you in the Howard County School System, I think that's probably the best way to help you get moving to where you, I think, want to go and to reach out to the students and get them involved. So I can get that information for you. Yeah, that'd be good. And I think something, too, that's, so we're a group of young adults in the community, and I think something um, we'd like to have happen is have our voice be heard and have action be taken, because I think um, something has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a group of individuals working together mm -hmm. to make it happen. Well, I think that if we have these other groups working with you, then I think that's the way at least find out some other way. And they might have ideas on how you can meet, meet more people. I think that's probably your biggest goal is try to reach out to more people and to be able to have a bigger impact on the community. So that's probably the best. I think that's probably the best way I can see it right now, but at least we can start there. Okay? Thank you very much. Appreciate I appreciate it. Thank it. You. No, thank you for taking time to come out. Yes, yes, sir. Hi, good evening. Good uh, evening. My name's Rodney Baylor. Thank you again for having this forum for us tonight. Mm -hmm. I've right. been a five year resident of Howard County between uh, the Columbia and Elk Ridge area. And while I don't speak for all of the residents, I know there are a number of Blue Stream residents mm -hmm. in the area. Mm -hmm. And I think our main focus is uh, the uh, potential implementation of a traffic light mm -hmm. right off the Route 1 corridor between the Port Capital and Blue Stream. Um, corridor, if you will. There's yeah. been a lot of construction over the last several years. There's also a, a new CVS breaking ground just past the state police barracks there. So over the last three years, traffic has just continuously increased and increased. And right at Blue Stream, it's, uh, it's kind of a unique shape because there's a hill um, as you crest, if you're going northbound, it's very difficult to turn into the Blue Stream community. If you're coming southbound, again, having some of the same traffic. Anytime there's uh, major traffic on the 95 corridor, everyone um, sidesteps over to Route 1. So for us residents trying to get in and out of our community, it can be a, a very daunting task early in the morning during rush hour, late in the evening. So I'd like to know what the uh, future plans are for getting a traffic light right there in that area. No. Thank you very much for coming out with that issue. And I've certainly had a lot of discussions with Mr. Sanker, who's developing that area. And uh, a couple of things I want you to know. Uh, one, there was a concern that since Kit Kat Road is getting a light, that we won't be able to get a light for Blue Stream. We've been told point blank from State Highway that's not true. Uh, they're taking away the light from Montevideo okay. because they don't need it there. And so our goal is to still try to get a light done. It is a state road, so we can't just say do it. Mm -hmm. um, as some may know, in order to get a light, you have to pass what they call warrants. And you have to have traffic studies done. Uh, one of the issues we have here, and it's difficult, is that everyone's afraid to turn left. Mm -hmm. And you know more than anyone else. If you live there, you're afraid to turn left. And so they're saying that the studies don't show people turning left. Well, they're not turning left because they're afraid to turn left. I mean, I've been there before, mm -hmm. and I go right to go left. Mm -hmm. um, and so the discussion we've also had with Mr. Sagner is the fact that they're trying to get the uh, food store there, mm -hmm. a small grocery store. And the issue would be is that if they come, the light comes. So it's almost like a catch-22. If the grocery store comes, you get a light. But you can't get a light until the grocery store comes. The grocery store doesn't want to say they're coming until they know there's going to be a light. And the state highway doesn't want to say we'll give you a light until we know the grocery store's coming. Seriously, that's the discussion we're having. And so um, the, what the most recent thing I heard today was that our Department of Public Works have been advised that, um, that if uh, the grocery store is willing to say we will come if there's a light built, and they just show the plans of it, the state highway will approve the light, or at least have the the warrant take into account what would happen with a food store. And that's the issue. If the food store is there, I think the, the, the traffic shows that it would need a light according to the state highway. I think it needs a light now. Um, so that's what we're going to work on with Mr. Sagner is to get something that says from the, from the uh, grocery store or the food store they have that they will be coming when a light's there and then we'll go ahead and try to get that all to happen. So my goal is to get a light there as soon as we can and we're working with State Highway and we're working with Mr. Sagner, but I appreciate okay. you bringing it to our attention. And what's the best way to just follow the status of that to find out? Um, I think you can contact our office. Um, I don't know if David Lee is here. There, David Lee's back there. He's, in, he's the head of our constituent services. Okay. If you can reach out to him, David, and, and give him your card, and then you can just contact him directly, and he can let you know what's going on with that. But right. we've been in constant contact with Mr. Sagner about that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No, thanks for your patience, too, because I know it's been a big issue. He was, was first. he first? I don't know yeah. who was first. He was first. Okay. Sure. Yes, sir. When I, I live on Alpha Mill Road, mm -hmm. and uh, I, you may know this already, 
Uh, I was um, on, a, on one of my walks, and I got to the Hollings River uh, Bridge. Why don't you a little bit closer, just because I want to make sure people. I here. looked into the river, and it was like a river of mustard. It was like a river of what? A river of mustard. It was oh. like the color of that curtain. Mm. It was coming from Montgomery County just before it uh, empties into the Patuxent River. It's, so uh, you may know this already. I don't know. No, I had not heard that. Yeah, well, they got signs at the Patuxent River Bridge, uh, sewage overflow. So I assume it's some kind of uh, treated sewage. But yeah, I had not heard that, but okay. You couldn't see the, it was just, you could only see the top of the river. Okay. It was a color of mustard flowing into the Patuxent. Mm -hmm. So okay. I just came as an eyewitness for one day. Well, no, it was in January. Oh. Mm -hmm. It was in January, so it was a, a month ago or so? Yeah. Okay. I, we can, again, we can check into that. I know see someone back to writing about that. We can check into that, and if you want to contact our office, we okay. can find out. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity oh, no. to talk with you this evening. Um, my name is Chandra Turner-Jones, my yeah. husband, Opal Jones, yeah. with our son, Ivan. Hi, Ivan. And Ivan is um, zoned for this particular school uh, district. And one of the main reasons we moved to Howard County was because of the phenomenal schools. Yeah. Um, and with all the things that have been happening recently, uh, with the, the racial incidences across the, the county, I just wanted to get your perspective and kind of ease our fear in terms of, you know, when he gets of school age, that it's going to be an okay environment for him and that he will benefit from the same, um, the same standards that um, the folks that are currently in Howard County Schools are enjoying. So could you oh, give us course, your perspective? Well, how old? He's nine months and change. Nine months and change. I remember those days. <laughs> I have four. Um, no, I, I appreciate your comment. And um, I, I assume you weren't at the State of the County last week, but um, I talked about this at the State of the County. And um, I talked a little bit about how my frustration with being the son of a civil rights leader, those of you who don't know, my dad worked in the civil rights movement in the 1950s, early 60s, um, and knowing all the people that worked hard to bring justice and equality and desegregation in Howard County, uh, it frustrated me that we're still dealing with this issue at all. And uh, it saddens me and it angers me, and that's what I talked about in front of, this, uh, of the audience in the state of the county. And, you know, I said that day, and I will continue to say it, it's got to stop and it's not acceptable, and we need to stand up and talk about it wherever we can. Um, Barbara Sands from our Human Rights Office has already put together a group of young people. Uh, they've already had one meeting together. Uh, I know that, um, that she's going to continue to have that because I do believe it can't just be an adult response, even though I agree with um, author Alex Haley who said racism is not automatic. It's not. You definitely get taught. Yeah. Um, um, and so we have to still work with adults as well, but I think we need to also have the children and the students take some ownership into how they can also deal with their peers. I think Mount Hebron students did a wonderful thing by standing up and showing that this isn't Mount Hebron. This might be a person from Mount Hebron, but it's not Mount Hebron. And that's kind of what I said at the end of my speech. I said that uh, we've got to change. We've got to fix this. And the reason I believed it would happen is because Howard County is a, it's a county I believe in. It's a caring community and it's a community that cares about justice and equality. So from my point of view, uh, we're going to have an administration, as long as I'm in office, that continues to promote that. Uh, I think our work with Harriet Tubman talks about that, too, the Harriet Tubman School. I mean, we're letting everyone know in the county that, that that's an important landmark we're going to preserve to make sure people will never forget what happened in the past. See, I've been around long enough, and I know how terrible it was and the stories I heard from people who came to our living room all the time. Uh, you know, from my dad being the first white person to join the NAACP of Howard County to being the only white president of the NAACP in Howard County. Uh, we had individuals in our house all the time, whether it be Reverend Holland, Silas Kraft, Elhard Fleury, or whatever. And so I know what it was like for them, and I don't want that to happen for our children. And so, rest assured, uh, as long as I'm county executive, we're going to keep on talking about it and working with the Human Rights Commission, working with whatever community wants to work with us. I know the Bridgeway had their form. I was there. Uh, I, I'm showing people that I'm taking a front seat on that one to make sure people know it's not something we're forgetting about. And as long as I have breath. Keep doing that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for expressing that, and yeah. thanks for your commitment. We oh, really no. appreciate it's, it's, it. It's it's more important here than here for me. I so appreciate it. So thank you very it. much. Thank you, ma'am. I don't know who was first. Okay, if you know. Okay. Hi, I'm Hi. Judith Birnbaum. Thank you very much for this opportunity mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. hear the public's input, um, and that's certainly uh, kind of. 
part of my frustration is that the uh, Board of Education does not seem to have that same openness. Um, I wanted to know your opinion on how our school system budget um, is used and those resources, which are a big part of the overall county budget, um, particularly the recently uh, approved contract of our superintendent, who has a lot of um, criticism. Well, I personally have a lot of concerns as a lifelong resident and somebody who is a product of our school system um, to see um, to see the public shut out, to see her push her contract through um, without public discussion and with a lot of um, really, frankly, shady practices. Um, she gave herself a, 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 an increase to $275,000, which I believe is about $100,000 more than you make, sir. Um, and, yeah. and I think, <laughs> I think, I mean, running the county, running the uh, school system, um, you know, you have to kind of wonder why that is going to get pushed through without any discussion um, and voted on before discussion. And there's just a lot of um, concerns with how the Board of Ed is conducting themselves these days, um, a lot of ethics concerns, a lot of concerns about mishandling things, including racism at Mount Hebron High School, um, including mold in Glenwood Middle School. Um, it's a very long list of things, um, bullying, um, denying public information requests. It's very upsetting to me as a, as a resident and I know that um, the school system, you know, operates a bit separately, um, but since it is county funds, um, I'm curious what your position is on all of those things. No. no, thank you very much and you certainly uh, have expressed what I think quite a few people in the community feel. Um, a few things I'll say right away. Um, you're right, when you talk about a school system, it is separate, it's a separate elected body, seven, seven elected by the citizens of Howard County. They represent you just like I do, uh, and they work for you just like I do. Um, dealing with the contract, um, I don't think it's appropriate to say that she gave herself the raise, just because technically it's the school system, I mean the Board of Education voted for it. Um, and I know that that was probably something they discussed for a long time, probably in closed session because it was a private personnel issue. Uh, I am concerned about what happened today. And I'll be totally honest, I've told board members this as well. Uh, I was concerned when I heard that there were apparently efforts to bring people to sit down in the seats when other people couldn't sit there. Um, that bothers me. Certainly, everybody here who is the, in here, uh, I don't tell anybody they can't come, and I don't tell anybody, hey, I didn't tell my people in my office to come here and sit down in the front row so no one asked me a bad question. Right, Judy George? <laughs> um, so, so I think it's important to have that openness and you know, I think it's important that you should be able to stand in front of people who disagree with you as well as people who agree with you. And you shouldn't worry if you, if you believe you're doing the right thing, it doesn't matter. I mean, people should be able to stand in front of you and criticize you and if you still think you're doing the right thing, you try to explain to them why you're doing the right thing and if, you're not, if they don't agree with you, frankly, that's what elections are all about. And so, um, so I do have concerns about that. Um, I will tell you that I did have a discussion with Dr. Foos today and also with the Chairman uh, O'Connor on a different issue on the, on the issue of air quality. And um, what I have done, and, and, and we uh, provide her with a letter today in the Board of Education, is that because of the issue of the concerns about air quality, uh, we have uh, offered, and we've been looking at this for a while to find out the cost to make sure, uh, we've offered uh, to have the county at, their own, at our own cost Mm -hmm. go in and inspect and test the air quality of schools. Um, I think we've done that because one, well first of all I want to say I do think that they've done work on Glenwood that has been good. I've been to Glenwood, I've talked to people, I've talked to teachers, I think the Glenwood Middle School is better. I really do. I've talked to, to, to teachers there that aren't talking to me because the school system told them to. Uh, so I think that was done, and I think I appreciate the fact that it was done. But there's still concerns of other places. So I think that it makes sense for having an independent. The county, county and whoever we hire would not be at all tied to the school system. And so I think it's something, and I'm, I'm hopeful that the, uh, the superintendent and the Board of Education will agree to that, because I think what support also realizes is I can't do that without them agreeing. Because again, it's a state a facility, it's state owned, and, and I respect the fact that they are a separately elected body, and they control those state buildings that I don't have control over. Uh, all I can do is offer. And so we've made that offer today. Uh, we had a good discussion on the phone uh, after I, uh, before I did that. Actually, I called her before I sent her a letter. Um, and so I think that um, I'm hopeful that they'll agree to do that. And I think that hopefully will bring some trust back if we have an independent county-funded uh, consultant go and check on the, on the air quality. But uh, I, I agree with you about the concerns about uh, 
uh, some of the communications, and especially the one, the one meeting you're talking about, uh, when I saw the email on the social me media, that concerned me. Um, and so I think that we need to make sure that everybody knows that they're available and they're open, because we work for you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, my name is Jennifer Cavey. Hi, Jennifer. I've uh, lived in Howard County for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. It's my first town hall meeting. Thank you. Um, and first time speaking at one. Um, I bought a very expensive house in Howard County mm -hmm. because of the reputation of the schools. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed because I am watching the school system reputation fall into disarray. There, as Governor Hogan said, there's a palpable lack of trust. I have two children in the school system, and it's, it's embarrassing to me. I'm bewildered, I'm confused, and I'll say it again, it's embarrassing. And I want to know what you're going to say to parents like me. And this, these complaints aren't just coming from a small group of crazy parents. And it's not just coming from the people within the political bubble. The concerns that I'm hearing, I'm hearing on the sport field sidelines, in the aisles of Target. I'm hearing these at PTA meetings, at the bus stop, at school drop off and pick up. The general Howard County moms are embarrassed, are furious, and are saddened. And when you ran for office, your platform was for transparency and for open seats at the table. And how will you, as county executive, Mr. Kennelman, what, what can you say to moms like myself who are embarrassed, bewildered, confused, and absolutely worried about the reputation of our school system and the investment that we made in these houses in this county that are based upon this reputation. Mm -hmm. What do you say, and will you demand change? Okay. And when you say, I just want to make sure I understand it, are you talking more about the lack of transparency concerns? Are you talking more about what specifically is happening inside the schools? That's what I kind of want to make sure. Sure. I'm talking specifically about what happened with Dr. Fuse's contract, okay. which we've already discussed. I'm okay. talking about possibly concealing a health crisis at the middle school, which you've also addressed. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about um, putting legal barriers in the way of special needs parents mm -hmm. looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And all of these issues, I mean, it's not just one, it's not just two, they just keep piling up and piling up. And when you have the governor and you have delegates Warren Miller and um, Peter Francho and county council members all speaking out about this. I mean, this is out in the public. This mm -hmm. isn't a small concern anymore. This is a large community statewide public problem. Mm -hmm. And it's really blemishing Howard County's otherwise fine reputation. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, that's one of the reasons I did what I did today about the whole air quality, was to try to figure out a way, because I think it's important instead of- Why today? Because we've been looking at the cost, because I can't just say we're doing it, we've got to look at the cost. Um, and we had our Department of Public Works and other folks looking at trying to figure out whether or not. And the second thing is you have to remember, we can't force ourselves onto them. We just can't. And to say you're going to do something when you don't have the legal authority to do it doesn't make sense. And it's a lot of grandstanding, but you can't do anything about it. So we have to work with the school system. And so. Well, I'm not pleased with some things I hear, I also know I have to work with them and I have to try to figure out a way to do a solution as opposed to just saying I'm mad about something. And so the only way I can do a solution is with an agreement with them to allow the county to come in and test it. I can't just say we're going to come test it because we can't. They literally can just say you can't come out our building because we don't own the building, they do. Um, so to me, and this is kind of the history I had in Annapolis, you don't just yell and scream, you try to work. And we've been working behind the scenes trying to get the information together so we can have a rational thing to propose to them to say, hey, this is what we think is the right way to go. And then if they say no, then we can sort of let everybody know we offered this and they said no. Um, but I think that's the best way to do something as opposed to, to just saying you're going to do something, you're yelling and screaming about something. I think I need to be a little more proactive in how it can be done and have a solution. So I think for the mold issue or the air quality, this is a great solution because the concern was that the testing was being skewed by the people they hired. Well, the best thing we can do about that is get an independent person to do it. And I think the county, uh, some people come to say, hey, we want you to do this. We'd say, hey, we'd like to. We've got to make sure that we're allowed to. So I think what we're doing now will hopefully bring some of the trust back, especially if it turns out that there isn't any issues with some of the schools that people are concerned about. If there are issues, then certainly we can do what we need to do to remediate those. Um, the other thing I will tell you is one of the biggest things, that, and I tell this to everyone everywhere I go and talk about fifth graders all the time, we have a huge election coming up. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, to do. me, <laughs> that's the biggest way the community can be involved is at the election. I mean, 
you know, some people say, well, you control their purse strings. Well, if you know the way the state law works with maintenance of effort, I'm required by state law to give them an increase every year. And I think this year the maintenance of effort is $10.9 million. I mean, if I do less than that, the state technically could take away some of their state funding. And so I really don't have that option. I mean, some people think, oh, just you got the purse strings on. I really don't. You also have the bully pulpit. I do have, and that's kind of what I'm working on today. Right. So. Um, and, 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 and it's also something where I think I need to also be the kind of person that works with people, knowing that I've got to work with them. You know, I, you know in Annapolis, you have Republicans and Democrats, and you can scream and yell as a Republican, and you get nothing done because you only have 12 or 14. Instead, what you do, you have to talk to them. And you have to talk to them, and sometimes you talk to them quietly, and it doesn't have to have a million people in the room because you're trying to work out something to make a difference instead of just being on the newspapers or being on t TV or having your name patched somewhere and saying, hey, rah, rah, that person yelled about it. No, I think it's good for citizens to express their concerns, but I think it's good for elected officials to try to solve the problem. And so that's what I'm working on, trying to solve the problem. Solve the problem and also come out affirmatively stating that you are going to solve the problem and that yeah. these are problems that you're looking to solve no, as no opposed to denying it. that problems exist in the first place. And so I think you. the other issue about transparency is the huge thing and communication is the huge thing. And as I just said before, that's why I do this. Seriously, I mean, I don't know if you, I can't remember any prior elected official who held these types of town halls when they were in office. I don't know, I don't remember any in Howard County. And I also don't remember hardly any who did it in the election year last time. I did it six times. And so this is what I think everyone needs to do. And I would think we'd do a whole lot better if the Board of Education did it, and if the county council members did it, and other state delegation members did it consistently, not just one time, but consistently, maybe two or three times a year. Go around the community, let people have a chance to tell you what's going on, because, you know, how better for me to know what's going on. So I appreciate you taking the time to come out, but that's why I'm here to show that I am listening and I am transparent and making sure everybody has an opportunity to express their views. Again, and if people aren't happy, that's what elections are all about. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody's here, so you're next. Hi. My name is Lana Hallamariam, and I, I don't know, I lived in, I don't know, Columbia for maybe 15 years, and I recently moved to Elk Ridge last year. Oh, yeah. um, so, and I only have one child, and she's in elementary school, and I love her elementary school, so I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't take anything away from the other parents, mm -hmm. but I'm very pleased. Um, however, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. I'm going back to Blue Stream, Good. and I, I heard your answer, mm -hmm. I don't like it. So what I want to say to you, I mean, you know, I, um, what I want to say to you is, is it concerns me that, um, that we can build, we can approve and build all these homes and bring in all this money into the county and then we don't worry about the people that live there and their safety on such a busy highway. It shouldn't be dependent on a grocery store. It should just be that we've got thousands or millions or whatever of people here and for their safety, we should do this. That's just how I feel. Okay, I, Wait, one okay, more okay, thing. Okay. Then, the because I have a really flighty brain so <laughs> do you remember or do you even know i don't you all have to help me out if you if you know that major accident that happened a couple of weeks ago does anybody remember that it was right at the intersection of blue stream drive and route mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. and what it did was it completely shut down route one the southbound side both yeah. lanes the northbound side only had one lane and i couldn't get home they literally like shut down the entire entrance to my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I decided to, and by the way, this is just a random rant that you don't have to address. The state officers that were out there were horrible. The um, firefighters, the EMTs were great, but the, the police officers that were there were absolutely useless. Um, they did not help the residents get home. Ooh. Like what, anyway, so I parked across the street and I took my daughter and had to maneuver across Route 1 traffic by myself because the police officer told me to wait. Seriously? I'm going to wait 30 minutes until you turn this car over and get this person out? No, I've got to get my daughter home. Mm -hmm. So I just winged it and got across the street and got home. And I feel like that should have been a wake-up call for the county. Something horrible is happening here. We need a light. Okay, okay. and I want to tell you, I... Don't disagree with anything you've said, okay. but I want to make sure you know the problem is it's not the a state. county road. Right. And so they have their requirements. So I don't like my answer either, but it is what <laughs> well, it is. Well, that's good. No, no, but I'm saying, but it is what it is. And I can't right. 
change that because it's a state road. Hey, so if I could put a light I there do? tomorrow, I would do it, but so I can't. So if I don't go to you, yeah. what state, is my other avenue? Well, to, uh, the State Highway Administration, but also to your, your representatives and state, de state delegation. And so, but all I can tell you is that we're doing what we can do because what we have, the avenue we have, is to work with state highways, to show them the need for it, why we advocate for it, but we can't force them to do it. Got it. Um, and they have these, like I say, they call it warrants, which is really strange, but basically requirements. Mm -hmm. and, they, and the reason they have those requirements, just so you know, is they don't want everyone just to get a light everywhere. And that makes some sense. You don't want lights just going everywhere or stop signs going everywhere. You want to have a reason for them. I think there's a clear reason of Bloom Street, but you know, we've got to go through those, those unfortunate hurdles to get there. So I don't want you to think I'm happy with my answer. I'm just letting you know that's the only process we have. Okay, so, so State Highway Administration is who I need to contact, SHA, yeah. and then also my state, state delegation delegate. Members. Okay, and then okay, this is the last thing I'm going to say. I promise I'm done, dude. Um, I want to say that you have been the most visible candidate. I mean, just hands down, in my personal opinion. Mm. I don't know if anybody else, been highly visible. I've seen you literally everywhere, um, mm. and I really appreciate that. So regardless of you know, whether you do everything that I personally Appreciate feel that. like you should be doing, I honestly feel like you're out there trying and you're trying to not represent your own needs, but really represent our voices and do what you can. And so I just want to say that to you, you publicly. I appreciate well, it. Well, no, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Even too. though I didn't like your answer. <laughs> But Bella Springs is a great school. Um, but no, but thank you. No, no, thank you for expressing your thoughts because that's what I need to hear as well. And it gives me a better idea of how to express it to the State Highway Administration. But we're continuing to work on it. We're doing the best we possibly can do. We have similar issues around other parts of the county. I can tell you at Rue 108 at Linden Lithicum, there's a real issue there as well. And we're having the same frustration with State Highway. We had, I believe it was three accidents, David. Was it three accidents? And we're like, three accidents? You know, there's, there's time to bring a light here. But accidents alone aren't the only thing to look at. So it's very frustrating to me. And the fact that people are afraid to turn left in some ways hurts because they don't have enough people turning left, which drives me crazy. So we're going to continue to work on it and see. Susan, were you or? Actually, the gentleman. Okay. So. Yes, sir. Yes. Hi, hi Mr. Kilman. Uh, my name is Ben Reifen. Uh, like I said, we've met before. Um, my question actually has more to do with uh, Columbia than it actually does at Elkridge because I've lived in Columbia like 90% of my life. Okay. Uh, maybe not 90%, maybe 80, but still. Okay. Um, <laughs> with, uh, so I heard rumors, I don't know if it's true, that there was talk about possibly demolishing the, the uh, bridge that connects right by the library to the Oakland Mills area of an apartment wow. which I used to live in, or I also heard, or I heard, uh, and possibly replacing it with other bridges to possibly build like more safer, either path bridges or with some of the roads they have make it more safer. Because in Columbia, there is actually only two safe bridges for pedestrians and cyclists and kids for that matter, because you know, kids, you know, that don't have cars, if they want to get around Columbia, they really can't cross 29 except on Seneca Drive and that uh, bridge over on, uh, uh, over right by between the Oakland Mills and the library. Okay. Um, is there any talk about possibly building any more bridges or demolishing any? Or is this even our duty because the, because I'm not sure if that bridge, the, the, the path bridge was even built by the county or whether that was done by CA? Okay. The, the bridge you're talking about, they call it Bridge Columbia, the one that connects downtown uh, town center to Oakland Mills. Uh, that is a county, prod, a county bridge. Um, so we, uh, we control that, we can fix it, whatever. It's not being demolished. Uh, there has been talk about expanding it to allow for transit as well as bike and pedestrian. And that's one thing we've been looking at. We've been working with folks who have been promoting it called Bridge Columbia. Um, we actually had a meeting this morning with, some members of, uh, with a member of the Bridge Columbia group. And one thing we talked about is you know, the need to get, when I, when I ran during the campaign, there was concern about having this bridge be more useful to connect and, ba and ba basically help revitalize Oakland Mills. Because if people can have an easier time getting across to go to downtown Columbia, we're going to have this revitalization of downtown Columbia. We're going to have one million square feet of office and commercial and, and a whole lot more going on down there that would probably help the revitalization of Oakland Mills if they can be connected pretty quickly there so people can live in Oakland Mills, go across that bridge, never have to ride, drive, or anything. And so we've been looking at that. Uh, so one of the things we're talking about now is looking at actually doing what they require in, in order to get federal funding, you have to do what they call a NEPA study, basically an environmental study of that area. And so we're talking about trying to work on getting that done now because uh, we can't do it ourselves. 
I think the, the bridge and the, and the people who advocate for it understand that we're going to need help from the state and the federal government. To we're working to see what we need to do to be able to get the case together that gets the help from the federals. It's not being demolished. We're actually going to do what we can to make it safer as well because a lot of people don't feel safe on that bridge. They feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I was going to bring up that issue too. Yeah. My I'm, 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 this is actually me and my sister are like asking mm -hmm. it together, but she was working late. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she was going to mention like some of the issues of security there. Like, mm -hmm. would there be like more officers on duty with that, or like maybe like officers on bikes even at night? Because even though it's not safe for anyone to really ride a bike on a path at night, mm -hmm. but uh, like something to like increase the security. Because you know, I used to live in Grand Point, and sometimes you know there was um, unfortunately some drug dealings down there there was even like almost always a cop there like on Friday or Saturday nights from like from like I don't know 10 till 10 p.m. till dawn or something mm, okay oh. okay, so, I, okay so um, I don't know if that's part of the, de the part of the issue with security on that bridge um, I don't I, I know we have bike patrols that have been expanded and I know they definitely go across the bridge I'm not sure the hours where they go late at night or not um, I will tell you it's interesting my uh, my daughter's a boyfriend used to live at Grand Point as well. And he could get to downtown Columbia faster than she could if she was driving from his house. And so it's certainly the bridge makes a lot of sense to kind of do whatever we can to help it. Um, and also it's my understanding Grand Point was purchased, I'm pretty sure, by a company and they're gonna to try to renovate it and, and make it better, which I think is a good thing as well. Um, but yeah, no, so the bridge is gonna be there. We're hopefully gonna be able to improve it in the short term to make it more safe, either through better cameras, that's another issue. There's cameras there now, but the cameras show what happened. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not something that you can see live. So like a 911 doesn't see what's going on, they just have a camera there to record what's going on. So got after you've been- in Baltimore City, that ain't yeah, stopping it. Nah. But no, but I mean, but I think that it could maybe be helpful if you had cameras there that actually were in the 911 center. That's and true. people who are working there actually had a camera showing that bridge as they were working. I think I that would be helpful. Told me actually. Yeah, and so there's things we're looking at and more lighting perhaps too, but the bigger picture is whether now we can get the funds from the federal government and state to make it a, a more useful bridge. So thank okay. you. It's not thank being demolished. Very, thank you very much for your time. No, thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming out. This is Garber. How are you, Susan? I'm good, thank you. Still short, though. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> uh, I want to add my thanks, um, as other people have stated, for your continuing to have these town halls. But I'd also like to thank you for inviting the public to your state of the county address. I don't remember that ever happening before. I, I will say I have heard it happen before, so I don't want to say I'm the first. Uh, but for those who don't know, we did a state of the county in the afternoon because the Chamber of Commerce has a history of that being one of their bigger events. Uh, but we also decided to do another one in the evening at the, at the banker room so anyone could come at 6.30 and watch it for free or watch it on TV, so that's what she's talking about. But I don't think I'm the first. I think other people have done that, but I'm, thanks for saying that. Well, I did appreciate how you yeah. did a shout out for all mm. the people who mm. contributed. Um, mm. That they, was- they, they do harder work than I do. Speaks to your character. <clears throat> but tonight I want to mention APFO. Mm -hmm. The Adequate Public Facilities Task Force has completed their series of meetings. There were over 20 of them. I tried to tune in yeah. when I could or attend when I could. And uh, I guess what I'm after is to find out what happens now. And I'd like to um, preface that by saying I'm worried that not everybody's going to be happy with the outcomes. Mm -hmm. If I can give you an example, in the final evening there was what I thought was a great motion mm -hmm. to introduce a high school schools test as well as the elementary and middle and the comment was made by an attendee that if they adopted that then six of the high schools would already be closed so those are very large areas that would be closed but as I sat there I couldn't help thinking isn't that the point if our schools are already so overcrowded, don't we need to go further, perhaps, than the consensus among the task force members um, was developed for? Okay. The fact that there was a high absentee rate at some of the meetings made it very hard to reach the two-thirds majority or whatever. So I'm asking, is there 
yet an opportunity to perhaps strengthen some of the recommendations that comes out of that task force. Okay. Well, I haven't got them yet, um, but I appreciate it. And I know Brent's here and others who had served on the, on the commission or the task force. Um, I know it's finished. I know they're working on the recommendations or working on the report, I should say. Uh, and once I have that, then I guess once we get the report, we can decide what we want to do from there. Um, with regard to high school, and I wasn't there for that, um, I think that that's something we, gotta, we can discuss all those things. That's why I want everybody there to be able to discuss, discuss all of those. Uh, I will tell you the one argument I've heard in the past about the high school, because when I served on the county <coughs> council back in 1998 to 2002, we did the last tweaking of it. And at that time, we did um, add a middle school test. It wasn't, at the time it was elementary, we added middle school. Uh, and the argument there was you don't want to do high school because not as many people move for high schools. They usually move when they're younger not when they're in high school age. That's all I'm saying. So I don't know if that was an issue that came up or not. Uh, but I'll look at the recommendations. I'll look at the report. And once we have that, then we can discuss what's the next steps. But I think I at least got to give the chairman time to be able to draft it and get it to me. And I don't want to make any preconceived judgments before I know what's happening. Okay. okay. But thank you very much. Thanks for serving. Yep. I think I've, she's been told I have to be ready for this. No, no. Okay. I got to get my, my vest on. Are you ready? I'm ready, Judy. Judy George. For those who don't know me and um, for those who are parents who are particularly frustrated, I s no. <laughs> um, there are at least five people or six people who are running for the Board of Ed and I've actually made eye contact or at least said hi to all of them and if they, if you are concerned, I would particularly mention to all the parents, make an effort here to reach out to them because they're here and they want to hear what Good you point. have to say. Good point. Yeah, I, actually, actually, everyone did before you came in, so why don't you stand up and introduce yourself. Everyone else already did. My name is Praveen Panuri. Okay. I'm sure there's more than me than who are standing for this right now. No, 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 no. Corey stood up and Kirsten no, stood up. And okay, yeah. Christina's oh, here too. Oh, I didn't too. see you back there, Chris. I'm sorry. Christina don't love small. Okay, and then? Praveen Panuri. Okay, and Vicky already did too. So anyone else I miss? Okay, thank you though. Thanks. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about APFO mm -hmm. some more. I yep. don't know who got some of the people on that APFO task force because I think it's a pretty stinking crying shame that I was at more meetings than they were. Okay. And um, I'm not kidding. I'm not. I'm I'm, I mean, I hear people laughing, but for a regular person who doesn't have to be at the task force, that you show up more than people who are on the task mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. mm, I want to know who invited those people or who pushed for those people mm -hmm. to be there. Mm -hmm. And then when they were there, they had no clue what they were voting on because they weren't ever there. Okay. So I'm very disgruntled about that. Okay. Um, another thing about APFO also is that, you know, at the meetings I hear they don't want to consider, you know, fire, fire component is not in there. And I think that's really important. You already know how I feel about the overcrowded situation. You already know how I think it's anybody who's lived in Howard County should be as least as irritated and annoyed and maybe you don't have to be as vocal as me, but you need to say, I don't like where this is going. Mm -hmm. I don't like that you guys are talking about not having moderate income housing units part being counted as part of APFO because kids live in those moderate income housing units. Where are those kids supposed to go to school if you're not going to count them in the APFO count? I'm, I, I'm, I no, mean, I'm listening. I'm listening. It's, it's just frustrating to me. And then the other thing is that um, I really would like you to consider talking to DPZ about the additional crowding that you plan for different parts of the county, especially on the east side, that we're crowded enough. There's no room for any more stuff. There's no more room for any more houses. Can you just like let businesses move in and do something else? Because the houses that are here, we don't have the infrastructure for any more additional, you know, we just don't have the infrastructure in the east. I know that was planned that way, but there's no additional, you know, the roads are bad. Everybody agrees the roads are bad. The schools are bad, and I don't even need to go into mm -hmm. the whole thing about the school district because that's mm -hmm. a little bit separate from you. But, you know, I don't want to hear any additional plans or bills or legislative anything about additional housing units. All the housing units need to count and be counted because 
what good does it do if we're gonna have like, oh look, we're gonna have this many kids. Well, if your kids are tripping all over themselves and they can't even learn, and they have to eat lunch at like 10 o'clock in the morning at two o'clock in the afternoon, that's not a conducive, you know, for a good learning environment. And one more time, please set aside some additional money for an additional school in the East. It can be a high school, it could be a middle school, it needs to be at least two elementary schools. But I need you to find some additional money to buy the land for those schools. Okay. Thank you. And that, let me just, on the, on the app though, just let you know, uh, each council person was given a choice. So there's five representatives there from each council district from that council member's request. Just let you know that's how we did it. And we did ask, um, we wanted to make sure there was people representing the development community as well as folks who had advocated for less development. So we tried to make it as even as we could and with different viewpoints. Not balanced. Well, I mean, I don't know if I agree with that or not, but I mean, I don't, I, I guess I wouldn't agree with that. I think we tried to balance it the best we could. The, 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 the committee itself made a decision that, that they wanted to have a super majority before they could make any recommendation. That probably caused some difference in making some things be voted on, but that was not my request. That was their own decision to do that themselves. I didn't, I didn't ask for them to make that request, though. So. Well, you just know you're yeah. going to see me when we talk about APFO at the county. Of course. Judy, <laughs> what would a night be without you? Um, <laughs> no, no, and I, I appreciate, no, I appreciate it, and, um, and talking about the, the school and all, we are actively in, in looking at a, at a location, um, and I think that there's already plans for uh, elementary school number 42, I believe it is, right, Ellen? And then, then this one, then another one would be 43. So we are looking, going th through that, and, and they're very actively looking at a site. So. But set aside money. Oh, no. Well, I wouldn't get a site if I didn't have the money. So we'd have to, yeah, we'll set aside start the money. setting aside the money because it's expensive. I, <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, and, you know, we are, I just got down, I came back from uh, New York City yesterday at the bond rating agencies because, you know, the AAA bonding is important for us to have so we can borrow money at a, at a very low rate. And I can tell you, that's one of the biggest things they look at, is what are we doing with bonds and how much are we borrowing? And the problem is, we gotta be very careful because we generally in Howard County had borrowed no more than $100 million a year, sometimes 95. The two years before I took office, we did 118 and 119. We just can't do that. I mean, we just can't afford that because the bonding agencies are gonna say, you just cannot, you just can't do it yourselves. And so we went down to 95 last year uh, I think we're going to try to do that or maybe less this year because we're just being told you have to do that. And so that makes it difficult then when you talk to community college and the libraries and the school system and the police department and so it has a lot of stuff going on. But I appreciate what you said and I, I appreciate that. Also, I want to acknowledge Amy Stratton is here as well. And I don't know if you're representing Congressman Cummings here, but she does work with Congressman Cummings. So thank you for being here, Amy. Yeah, Gary. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gary Evans. I'm with Lenar. Only to segue into no more homes. Yeah. So <laughs> well, I just wanted to, it's kind of a public service announcement yeah. for, we are the builders of Blue Stream, yeah. one of one of them, the uh, residential component. Right. So we do have 230 homes in the neighborhood, which is 460 drivers. So part of your transparency was mm -hmm. to put them in touch with your right. constituency services guy. Mm -hmm. I have a better built okay. mousetrap, and that's your Howard County website. Mm -hmm. You go on to Planning and Zoning's website, you can track all of the development phases through the process in Howard County. It's all transparent. So I use it as a tool myself. I would encourage our residents and all the citizens to jump on the website, figure out what's in what process, so you don't have to be told when a shopping center is coming in or a grocery store or another development. It's already there. Yeah. So it's kind of a public service announcement. I okay. love the website. I use it as a tool. Good. Just wanted to share that to everyone that's here. Thank appreciate you very much. I Good appreciate night. it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Diane Costello, yeah. and um, I want to thank Ms. George. She actually brought up a topic that... She teed it up for you, huh? She did, <laughs> and uh, she put it in just the right light for us because my son and I discussed on the way here today what could we talk about mm -hmm. that affects him, that, um, that could be poignant for everyone. Mm -hmm. And do you want to talk about what it is? All right, okay. Make sure you can hear you, yeah. Way to go, Scott. No. Okay. So, um, when What's I your name again? My name is Zach Costello. Zach. Nice. So, a couple, right before the school year during the summer, we moved from a house about two, a mile and a half away. Yeah. Yeah, a mile and a half away. From there, I was going, I'm in eighth grade now, so I was scheduled to go to Howard High School. Um, now I'm scheduled to go to Mount Hebron High School. So, 
The school district here um, in our county, I have to say, is a little wacky. <laughs> <laughs> um, because one neighborhood um, is going to Centennial, one is like ne right next to it's going to Howard, and then another one is going to Hebron. So I think the maybe you could have a say or talk to the Board of Ed about maybe straightening up the school districting mm -hmm. to um, help not just the overcrowding, but also make it a little more logical. Okay. No. Uh, no. I, hey, that is also that's a very intelligent question, a very adult question too, because we actually have a whole committee. I think, right, Ellen? I think they have a whole committee of uh, citizens who work on drawing the districts when it's time to have new districts. But you're right. We need to have districts that are reasonable and understandable. It's difficult when you have uh, populations growing. As I look at Judy, um, but but you're right. Uh, it'd be nice to figure out ways in which neighborhoods don't get split apart and do it next door. But uh, that is actually something that the Board of Education deals with more than I do. I don't work with their redistricting. I don't have a say on that. But um, but you've said something that I, quite a few people in this room who may have a say or do have a say have heard. Right. So as people, as Judy has said, you should probably talk to a couple of these people before you leave today to let them know your points. Okay. Thank you very much, Zach. I appreciate you letting us know. Thank you. And along with that. Um, the overcrowding Zach didn't bring up. Um, mm -hmm. For example, I, I just want to build upon the overcrowding. Mm -hmm. A couple of his classes, he's got 28, 30 kids per teacher. Um, that's for GT maths, for Spanish, and a couple other classes are, are pretty up there. Mm -hmm. um, I just found out last night that the fire marshal has had to cite Burley Manor because well. their orchestra is overcrowded. The room, they can't have that many kids in the room at wow. one time to play, mm -hmm. but there's nowhere to put them. Mm -hmm. um, it, would, it would take at least a double portable to be able to have the orchestra practice together so that again moves to redistricting mm -hmm. or uh, building more schools and so you had said talking about money when when can we expect we we're Ellicott Mills so we're Eastern yeah. um, still too. Oh, he goes to Ellicott Mills? He goes to Ell Ellicott Mills. I went there when I was a kid. <laughs> it was called Ellicott City Middle School back then. Yeah. Um, but when can we expect mm. some of the new buildings? Again, that's the school system makes that decision. I can only help provide the funding for yes. it. Yes. <laughs> and so, uh, and so we, um, I know they're working on, is it Elementary School 42 again? I can, 42. I know they're working on that. Um, I know we're looking at a site for the uh, 13th high school or possibly an elementary school or other, whatever they decide there. Yeah, 43, and, and yeah, so um, so they're working on that, but I really, seriously, I be totally honest, I don't control that at all. I control the funding for it, or help them with the funding. The state does a lot of it as well. So uh, we will make sure that they have the funding they need to, to build what they need to build, um, but um, deciding when and where is a decision the Board of Education right. makes. Certainly the overcrowding mm -hmm. doesn't help with mm -hmm. the new housing units going no, in. No, there's no question about that. It truly no doesn't about help. That. No. Okay. No, I appreciate, I appreciate what you said. And, and again, you know, Ellicott City Middle School was a great school, but it completely tore it down. The only thing that's left from my school that your school is the sign out front. Those bricks <laughs> are the sign from when I was in school there. Um, but thank you very thank much. You. Also, as we talk about the Board of Education, um, young people here and others who are not so young, um, this is a great time to get involved. If you want to be involved in the process, this is when you can do it. And I will tell you, that's what I did first. My very first campaign I ever worked on was 1974 when I was a sophomore in high school for Noel Myricks for Board of Education. It was an African-American gentleman that my dad introduced me to who was running for the school board and I said, you know what, I want to do something. And so I actually went out and started working on this campaign. He lost, but not because of lack of trying. And I just think it's a great way for young people to get involved. You don't have to be able to vote to be able to help. And you can be involved and you can get yourself understanding of what's going on in the community. So everybody here, and I, most of you are involved because you're here, but if you know anyone else who would like to be involved, please encourage them to get involved in the Board of Election campaigns right now. If they want to get involved in the presidential or congressional or, or Senate, that's fine. But locally, the biggest thing we have is the Board of Education this time. And so I think that's a great way for young people to learn about the process by being involved and supporting an individual they, they, they like. Let's go on, Rick. Hello. Hey. Um, 
So as you can imagine, uh, I am here to talk about the Howard County Public School System. Mm -hmm. um, and in listening to all of the things that were said here tonight, first of all, I appreciate that you have requested um, the independent inspection of the schools for air quality, that, you, that you're working with the Board of Education and the superintendent to, to get that done. And it appears that is your, uh, your mode of operation. That's, that's how you do things, is, 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 is working together, negotiating, talking with each other. Uh, and I, I do appreciate that. So I want to call something to your attention um, in the school system budget that you may want to include in your conversation okay. with said officials, and that is the special education budget. Um, there was a lady over here who testified earlier, or in her question earlier, mentioned that there have been barriers, legal barriers, put up um, against special education parents uh, recently, and it is worse than ever. Um, there are, there is more money in the legal budget and less money in the special education budget, and. By that I mean there might be a few more positions funded in certain areas of special education, but school-based services where the, where the teachers and the support staff and the related service providers are in each individual school has not increased at least in the last two years. And it's not, project, it's not if you look at whatever budget page it is on school-based services this year, there is no increase in professional or support staff and a projected increase last year and this year in the number of students that will be enrolled in HCPSS and approximately 10% of those students are special education. So I think that's a conversation that I will hope I would hope you would have when you are in budget negotiations behind the scenes. I realize that publicly it's very difficult to be in the position that you're in. Um, you know, we. this is supposed to be the crown jewel of Howard County, and you are our, le our fearless leader. Uh, and, fearless, yeah. <laughs> but it is exceedingly frustrating mm -hmm. to see what is happening to, budgets speak to priorities. And this one does not speak to special education or or really class the classroom as a priority. The media secretaries and the paraeducators from kindergarten that were cut from last year's budget are not projected to be re restored. The, the special education issue I just mentioned to you, mm -hmm. the, there was a, a, a meeting last night in collaboration with HCEA and PATH of educators and parents of, in special education about 35, 40 people were there, and the biggest issue that came up is staffing. Mm. They, there's not enough staff. The parents know it, the teachers know it, and and it's, it's a huge problem, and I think you need to be aware of it because you are going to be right. sitting down make, you know, having budget negotiations with mm. the school system. When, have any of the board members explained to you why they're not doing that with special education? I'm just curious if you get any response, or have you asked any questions? It's not, I'd be curious to know what their are what their rationale is for having not more if that's coming. I still, I'm just curious. I have not heard a rationale. Okay. 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 I mean, there are also there's always going to be budget issues, but questions whether or not you where you put the money. You know where you know there's well, always going to be budget. Well, there is an increase in the request in that's the saying, legal, legal mm -hmm. uh, fees department, and mm -hmm. uh, no okay. increase in the special okay. education school based services. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Thank for bringing you. my attention. Yep. Hey, Joel. How are you? Hi. Is this working? I think so. Do you want to put it a little bit higher? Because I mean, Zach was not. Yeah. You could probably just pull this back. There you go. Two hands. No. All right. For your record, Joel Hurwitz. Yeah. Um, last question I asked uh, the council at their conversation okay. earlier today. Oh, okay. Dealing with uh, owner occupied affordable housing in mm -hmm. Columbia. Okay. Uh, can a year or so ago, when Columbia Association was giving their uh, recommendation, that I guess they were asked to regarding okay. it. They had issues with the fact that all the buildings were being apartments and there were no condo ownership. Mm -hmm. And so I did some research to find out what you could do because they said, well, how do you pay the condo fees is one of the issues that they had. Okay. 
and I discovered the Affordable Housing Land Trust Act, which was passed in 2010, and you were part of the unanimous mm -hmm. passage in the mm -hmm. General Assembly. Mm -hmm. And apparently because it was unanimous, I'm getting a feeling nobody remembers it. Um, I have been... By the way, most bills are unanimous, <laughs> just to let you know. Most bills everyone agrees upon because it's an easy issue, but okay, go ahead. Ben. So a year or so ago, I went to the downtown Columbia Housing Corporation and, and mentioned that to them, and they hadn't been aware of it. And the staff from DPZ, their liaison, I shared that information with him. He hadn't been aware of it. Because um, I have this law review article that mentions the challenges in Colombia, mm -hmm. But the people in Colombia don't know about the, the law. Um, so again, this Saturday, I mentioned it to the Housing Corporation, and Greg Fitchett, he wasn't aware of it again. Cause, mm -hmm. And you told the two bodies, apparently, to come up with a joint plan. Mm -hmm. And since nobody was aware of it, they <laughs> didn't put it in there. Um, I've been told that the market forces or that more apartments were desired. That doesn't mean that you'd have no other mm -hmm. options for somebody who wants to actually buy something. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking of the flyer building, which I know you wanted to sell, and I guess the plan of putting the air rights or building over the fire station would even be more beneficial, I think, under the Land Trust Act, because the county would have to maintain some ownership interest to have a fire station. So how do we go about getting this back into the mix? And I guess, as I said, Delegate Bobo was co-sponsor of this bill. Mm -hmm. So I'm no expert in this field, so why uh, the people who have been working on this as a priority in our community don't know about this law that was passed in 2010. Okay. Well, no, I appreciate you bringing to our attention. I'm sure you already started putting it in the mix because you talked to people on Saturday at the pre-submission, I guess is what you're talking about, um, and, and you talked to others. So that's certainly something I can have a discussion with folks as well. And when you said that I asked them to all come together to plan, it was myself at the county council. I don't want to take credit for it, even though I think they've worked pretty hard and they've actually put together something that's pretty good. Uh, I will tell you that everything does show that market forces are calling for more apartments because people are less likely to buy houses now. They just are. And more people want to rent, whether they're young or whether they're older, they don't want to necessarily live. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have any, and I understand that. Right. So. But we can certainly look at that, and, and you brought that up, and, and I know someone probably wrote it down, and, and we'll talk to the folks that, um, that are working with it. But you brought their attention already, so I assume that they're already looking well, at it. Well, we apparently, I need to send it yeah. to the council. They're, they mm -hmm. want to know more about it. Again, yeah, it seems good. that the people who are dealing with this is their job. I. I well, I mean, there we definitely were housing it. advocates and housing attorneys on the group that were putting it all together. So, and I know so. Frederick County's doing it. I saw that when they adopted their charter a couple years ago. Apparently, Howard County and Executive Oldman helped them with their charter. Okay. I think apparently we need to go ask them about how they're working with with their affordable housing land trust that they've okay. established there in Baltimore City and a couple okay. of communities. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Thank you for bringing it up. I appreciate it, Barbara. Hello. Hey, Bob. Um, my name is Barb Krupiars, and I'm standing close. Yeah. Um, and you know this story already, but for everybody here, um, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I have two boys in Howard County Public Schools, one of whom has a disability. I'm also the chair of the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. And the school system did a $300,000 audit of special education. Um, and the superintendent talked about the preliminary report from this audit in a public board of ed meeting. And a, another parent of a special needs child did a Maryland Public Information Act request for the preliminary report and the formal response from the school system was no such report exists. I did a Public Information Act request for the parent survey data to help our, our committee have um, valuable information to help the school system. And they said from this $300,000 audit that um, the contractor owned that data. So I filed a circuit court complaint and um, the school system's attorney said I was on a crusade against the school system, that I was trying to get personal information from about students with disabilities. Um, he spoke to the judge without my attorney's um, knowledge. And um, the, the judge, I, I believe, came in against me. And this um, attorney went after me for sanctions. Um, for minor mistakes that my young lawyers made, because I made the mistake of hiring young lawyers who didn't have a lot of experience and so I it was going nowhere and so I found I tried to settle the case four times and they continued to to litigate 
and pay this hourly attorney that they have. Um, and um, so I just dismissed the case. I never got what I was asking for. And so my question for you is, I know you're an attorney, mm -hmm. and I wondered if that is uh, a typical practice for to go after a, a citizen for sanctions mm -hmm. for mistakes that their attorney made. Um, and a first caveat is I didn't handle those type of cases. I never had to deal with that, but um, I would have I would assume that most times you try to work out things without causing sanctions. I would think that that's what your main goal would be, is to try to resolve something without a sanction. But uh, again, I know you're, I hear what you've talked to me. Uh, I don't know all the particulars of it, but I think sanctions are usually the last resort. Sanctions only come when you've gotten to the point where you can't do anything else. And it sounds to me like you already were willing to dismiss the case. So. And yeah, it was $9,368, just so people yeah. know that. Yeah, but I, I think people, sanctions are one of the last things you ever, ever, ever ask for. It should be like the very, it's almost like to the point where I can't do anything else and, and I must do something, so. Right, so um, I, I bring this up because I appreciate the fact that you work with people um, to try and resolve things, but at, at some point you have to say enough is enough. Right. I, I do, so. I do, but I also have to work with people and so, um, I need to make sure that I can keep that relationship because it's just like saying Annapolis, you might disagree on something, but you do it in a disagreeable, in a, in a non-disagreeable way, you do it in a respectful way so that you can continue to work on the next issue together. And that's kind of what I've tried to do. I've tried to be respectful uh, because I think somebody has to be here to pick up the pieces. So, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Brent. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you? I didn't know. Another. Oh, I didn't see Heather. Okay. She's, he's, pointing, he's pointing to Kim. Kim, I'm sorry, Kim. He's pointing to you. I should know you're here. I didn't know you were here, Kim. Kim Prime's here from Councilman Calvin Ball's office. So thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Phil's better pointing to you. So, yeah. Okay, Brent. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name's Brent Loveless. You're very familiar with me working with mm -hmm. the council and you. And um, I greatly appreciate you um, mm -hmm. allowing me to serve on the APFO committee, no. which is uh, of much discussion tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, here we are at, at Duckett's Lane Elementary. It, it's a beautiful school. Look at it. This is very beautiful school, but what you aren't seeing this evening is that it's also one of the most overcrowded schools in Howard County, and it's on the books to be overcrowded. And despite capital improvements, despite the new elementary school coming and redistricting, it will still be one of the most overcrowded schools. And regardless of this school, among 73 schools, we still have a problem with capacity for our school system. Our high schools are averaging 110% capacity. We have a long ways to go to fix it, and we aren't going at the rate to fix it. We need to address a culture. I, I've come to you with a lot of very tangible, very black and white, very defined items to solve. But this is more intangible. There is a culture from our development community right now. And we have tried to address our overcrowding issues at the state level, at the Board of Education, at the council, every level possible. Mm -hmm. And you know our school has been, Forest Ridge Elementary has been very vocal in this too. And not just for ourselves, for all, all the schools. And there are some things that are within your control and some that aren't. And what I come to you is to address the things that are within your, okay. your control. The, the culture right now, there is so much pressure to develop that we, we aren't able to put in the controls, the restraints, in order to do things to be sustainable. It's a heavy, high pressure culture. You're aware of the culture. Our issues talking with the, with the school system is, is one of them. Our, our issues dealing with the development community is another. You are, you are absolutely aware of the pressures that my family has been yeah. under during the committee. Yeah. I have an aunt right now who's homeless because her home has been bulldozed yeah. while her husband's dead and no one, she, she still has title to the home. And we, the pressure that we get, I talk with our firemen, our police, our, our teachers, people with clearances, they feel that if they go out, if they go out on the limb, if they push, and they push hard to do the right thing, to make things sustainable, that profit motive on the other side is enough that there's legal repercussions. 
you look at the um, at our referendum effort that was going on. Mm -hmm. There were people who didn't want development on graveyards. Mm -hmm. They didn't want it on steep slopes and environmental right. sites and historic right. sites. Much like I've worked with them on the Savage Mill so much. It's very important to us as a mm -hmm. community resource. But the pressures are unbelievable. And you can see even the lawyers are, trying, are being disbarred right now at, as retaliation for going up against this. This culture is one that Howard County's had for generations, and it's getting better, but it's a long way, long way from being acceptable. And that is something that we need to address in a much higher level. And your individual efforts are getting there, but we need to really pour it on for this. Um, I'm, I'm looking, you know, here I was on a committee recommending safety improvements. Our development community, at the same time, voted against us, and literally I had a person killed on my street at the exact moment when that vote was going down. This is real. There are real people. The, the trailers, they aren't going to all burst on, all in flames in one day, but they are a much higher risk than our brick and mortar schools. We can do better. I've been watching your spending affordability committees. Mm -hmm. I've been seeing what they're recommending. Mm -hmm. You know what we're proposing in, in APFO. And I think I don't know. Actually, I don't know yet what you're proposing. I'll you find will. out soon. You yeah. will. And you will see that there will, even when mm -hmm. all said and done, mm -hmm. we will need to address more, much more mm -hmm. after we're done. And, but most importantly, we need to fix the culture because without a change in culture where people can feel like they can work, and be on an even keel with our development community, they're going to, there is a lot of people who are being made example of right now while they're trying to help the citizens of this county. Mm -hmm. And we aren't asking for blood, we're just asking for fairness. Okay. And I'd, I'd like to see what solutions you have coming forward or thoughts you have on that mm -hmm. topic. Okay. Well, so I just, you know, thank you for your service on AFO. I mean, for those, I mean, Susan brought it up. That committee has met many, 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 many times and many, 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 many hours. And I know you have been steadfast. He's not one of the ones that missed, I'm sure, ever. He never um, missed. And so, so thank you for that. And I do, and I'm sorry for what your family, I know about what happened there. And I'm sorry for your aunt and for your family and for you personally, too. Um, I mean, I think we're doing what we can to, to address that whole culture. We're trying to be a little more open. And we're trying to make sure everybody has an opportunity to talk about it because I think if everyone has the opportunity to talk about it, then at least it's out there in the open. And then it's not like something is being done without anybody's knowledge. We're trying to make sure that DPZ is doing more to be open to people and to make sure that things aren't being allowed that shouldn't be allowed. Um, we're doing the best we can. We do have regulations and we have requirements and sometimes, you know, I can't change those. Um, uh, I said during the campaign that if something was happening and there's a regulation we didn't like and instead of getting a waiver, we should just change the regulation. And that's still my view, is that we need to look at it that way. Uh, there are certain times when maybe something needs to be just, uh, you know, fig figured out where they could do it, but generally, and I think that kind of culture in DBZ is starting. I think that Val Lasdens has been a good person to start listening and we talked about the Citizens Planning Institute uh, having something where uh, DPZ can bring folks in from the community who want to learn more about how the development process is done so they can be more involved in the process. I think it's a good thing. I think our website designed to be a little more easier to understand is a good thing. Um, so I think we're working on that and I think a lot of it comes from just how we approach and how we treat the people who we work for. We work for you. And so we got to make sure we do that. So I think we're working on that, but you know, that's why we want to continue to have these dialogues so we can learn more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Good yeah. to see you again. Yeah, I guess we'll pull this down today. I know. Good to see you. Too short. Yeah, they're fine. Hi, my name is Teresa Merrow, Good and I represent the Friends of Havilah yeah. Mill Road. Mm -hmm. We're concerned about uh, cluster development coming mm -hmm. onto our road. Um, we think cluster development is great for Howard County but it's not great for Havlin Mill Road. The um, set-aside preservation land is on sensitive environmental uh, property. It has streams, it uh, feeds into the Patuxen River. It's just not conducive right. to this land that they plan on developing. Uh, the set-aside land, they have little slithers of land here and then over there. It's in all different areas, it's fragmented. 
uh, future homeowners will not be able to get to this land to use it, but they'll be paying taxes on it. They won't be able to steward it. They won't be able to mow it. Um, if you're going to have it that way, you need to build roads so these people can get to that land that they're paying taxes on and that they own. Or you need to decrease the amount of houses that DPZ is approving. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they can approve all this fragmented land to begin with and land that can't be built on. I think that part of cluster development needs to be investigated because mm -hmm. I think it's, um, it's not being handled right. Mm -hmm. I think the developers are getting all the advantages and the citizens that live around this cluster option is not. Mm -hmm. Cluster development was um, beginning to be used properly when Paternal Gift Farm went in, mm -hmm. but now it just looks like a bunch of dumped houses in the middle of nowhere and the land that's being preserved around it most of the time is just uh, land that can't be built on to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it's not being preserved for farmland. It's mm -hmm. not being preserved for the people that are living in this squashed up community that's called Cluster for some of these roads. I think it needs to be worked on and I believe Haviland Mill Road should be developed in that little piece of land as 4.25 acres like mm -hmm. most houses are approved in Howard County. Mm -hmm. It's just not being used right. Okay. So I'd like for mm -hmm. you to look into this. I'd like mm -hmm. for DPZ to stop giving us just the cold shoulder and a pat on the head. Mm -hmm. um, we're frankly a year and a half into this and we're tired of that. Mm -hmm. I have written um, letters to the governor, lieutenant governor, all our delegates. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I would just like you to take mm -hmm. a leadership role in this um, mm -hmm. for Haviland Mill Road. I think you mm -hmm. can work to uh, the advantage of the road. Um, the road is historic. It has historic homes on it. And um, if possible, even if you, if Howard County and the state could buy even a little portion of it and then put the 4.25 acre homes on it would be better than this. Um, cluster development, which is kind of like a joke on this land. And also, well, thank you. Thank you both for coming out, and thank you. You don't know, she didn't say it, they gave me a tour. And so yes. I went and, and well, reviewed thank you for it. Coming and, to that. and I did also, um, I have discussed it with a developer, and the property's already been sold and con under contract mm -hmm. or whatever. There's things that we can't do, there's things that we just don't have the regulations allow uh, what's being done to be done. So. No, we, I can continue, but I know that we responded the best we could to what we have tried to do and talk to people about it. But um, I don't want to offer any promises that anything's going to be different because I'm not sure we can. Um, but, but, but DPZ and the county is the one that approves these plans. They do. They and do. this set-aside land does not go to the intent of cluster development. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at it, it, it really is a joke. I mean, you have a, a few acres over here. You have a few acres over there. It's mostly steep slopes and streams and forests mm. that you can't build on, and that's environmentally protected. Okay. So I think yeah, that I, I appreciate your you saying, and I, I can almost guarantee the person behind you is going to bring it up as well, since um, since I she's the, so. she's behind paternal gift. But thank you for bringing it up again. Thank you for your advocacy. I know you guys have fought for it hard, but I'll switch over. No, no, no. I was going to say because it would be a great segue to to, to <laughs> Sue. <laughs> Go ahead, Sue. All right. Well, I am just here also in support of that, yeah. and and to say that the it is really a joke. It is not a mm -hmm. typical cluster development mm -hmm. because a piece of land is not whole. There are little pieces around here that become the open space, which the developer should at least tell you how they're going to maintain it mm -hmm. and use it because it will not, cannot be used in either way. Okay. But I have always given you the objectives for mm -hmm. good cluster zoning before, so I'm not going to do that tonight. Okay. I'm just going to invite you to paternal gift. Mm -hmm. for I've been, I've I don't think you have been on our two-mile walking trip. I have not been on that, it's a but two I've been mile, in It's a two-mile yeah. asphalt walking path mm -hmm. around the cluster where you can see it. Mm -hmm. And please bring Mr. Lasden with you okay. and whoever would like to come because I don't think I think seeing it will be worth okay. a thousand words. Okay. That's one thing. The other mm. thing I wanted to do was to say, as president yeah. of the Greater Highland Crossroads Association, yeah. we're delighted to have the Interim, Interim Development Act and to be working with DPZ to plan mm. our future and to not have BRX zoning taking us over. Okay. And mm. I wanted to also say that the public survey of Howard County Transportation Project, mm -hmm. the survey that just came out today, I wanted to thank you for that. And I wanted to say I hope that um, we in Highland can take advantage for that. We, as we envision what our crossroads will be like, 
we very much envision pedestrian walking and bicycle paths mm -hmm. through the crossroads. We have numerous communities, Highland Lakes, all United States, many, many, that feed big communities onto those roads and then they could walk or ride their bikes down to the crossroad. And mm -hmm. all the bikers who come through all the time could safely get through the busy intersection. So we're going to put that on the new survey Thanks. and we thank you for having that. Um, and one thing you probably will be surprised to know is that I'm an Elk Ridge girl. I, I went to that. Elk Ridge Elementary School. Okay. I went to Not the El current one, I don't think. <laughs> no, no, but the one that's like an apartment building across the street. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh. oh, Kathy Hudson. Yeah. Yeah. Just like I didn't go to the elegant mills that he went to, the Zach went to, yeah. Uh, the Catholic Church? No, yeah. no, no, no. Right no. across from Norbell. Yeah. 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 Anyway, and, and across from the elementary yeah, school now. Yeah, across okay. from the elementary school. Anyway, okay. and yeah. I went to well, good. the I middle school that. course, and I was in the freshman class of the first Howard County High School, the first freshman class there. So, and because of that, one thing with the um, mm. State Road Route One, yeah. I lived in a little community called Harwood mm -hmm. I know it. on Loudon Avenue. I didn't live on Loudon Avenue, but that's our main road. And my sister and I still come back to this area to take care of our graves at um, St. Mm. Augustine Church oh. and all around, and to have a special lunch at the Farnes Inn. But I have to say that the entrance to Harwood community, many houses back there, is appalling. Mm. And I don't know if that will fit into the transportation survey. Okay. It falls in the crack. It's, mm. a, it's not a county road until you get into the community and you okay. don't own the property. But it is a shame that the people who live in that nice community for working class mm. people have such an entrance. Okay, good. I, thanks for bringing it to my attention. And one yeah. other little thing I wanted to mention since people are working is, is that um, I have read several times about wonderful affordable housing of mm. senior citizens and single parents. Mm. Where they get special rates for their housing and the, the senior citizens help the single parents mm. to take care of the children during the day when the parents can't be there. Mm. And it's been successfully done in Portland, Oregon mm. and in many different places and it is a happy combination. And I think people okay. who are doing affordable housing may want to look at it. Well, thank thank you, you for your time. No, no, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you for all the stuff that you have done and all the ways you've been involved in our community for many, many years. That's great. That's great. Grace, and then we're going to have to yeah. Thank you. Hi, Grace. Hi. How are you? I'm great. I, I came tonight. I live in Ellicott City. Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you for doing this town hall yeah. meeting. So what's my issue? My issue is 5,500 units, okay, in downtown Columbia on 396 acres. Mm -hmm. Your administration is supporting, uh, to the best of my knowledge, mm -hmm. okay, a very complex development rights agreement. Uh, can you give me two reasons, since part of the proposal is to remove the requirement from Howard Hughes to contribute mm -hmm. their residential um, component to the residential units into a housing trust fund, the equivalent of approximately anywhere between 33 to 43 million dollars. Um, and because I know another piece of legislation is coming. Uh, which is called a TIF. Um, so I'd like to at least understand why that versus what has happened as a housing policy in the county for new development, which is a requirement for moderate income housing to be built inside of each new residential um, component building. And Howard used to all intents and purposes as being excused from that requirement so they, if they were standing here, would tell me that they're not excused because they want to provide housing at 80 percent of median uh, for Howard County, which is a 79,000 and above, um, and also provide 200 units of that, and also provide 200 units of Section 8 housing, which is not new housing in Howard County, but drawing from the pool that we already have. Mm -hmm. So I just ask you very directly. Um, why are you pushing this? Okay. Sure. No, I appreciate that. And um, as you know, and I, it'll take too long to go through all the details because we'd be here for 14 hours. Um, and we, you, I'm sure that you've discussed it with the uh, Downtown Housing Corporation, everyone there. Um, initially, 5,500, and there was a requirement to pay basically a fee that made the 36 to 40 million dollars. It wasn't me that came out and said we want something different. 
It was the Downtown Housing Corporation that said, we can't make it work with that money. It doesn't work. And so when Howard Hughes purchased GGP, they purchased the requirement to give the money, and, they, and that's the game they purchased, if you want to call it a game. That's, that's, that's the plan they purchased. Um, there was discussion then to say, oh, no, just make it do 15% of the 5,500 moderate income housing. Uh, the concern there is, frankly, I think it's fair concern, is that when somebody buys a company with an understanding of this is the way it is, and there's a requirement to pay the money, and they're willing to pay the money, now we're changing that, those rules on them after they purchase. I think that's not necessarily fair. So, along with members of the, certain members of the county, county council, the Downtown Housing Corporation, along with other advocates, worked together to try to find a plan that worked. And I had no predisposed saying, this is what I want you to do. They just got together and tried to figure out a plan. And it was something that it's my understanding that Downtown Housing Corporation, all except one member who I think left because of it, uh, supported it. So that was housing advocates. Um, and it was something that we could get the support of Howard Hughes, which not necessarily was an easy thing to do. And we're trying to work out a compromise. We've talked a lot tonight about how at least the folks that work in my administration try to work out solutions instead of, of just hitting ourselves in the, in the wall with our heads. But, um, so I think that's why I think it's going forward. That's why I think it's better than, uh, than what we had in the past because uh, my fear from the Downtown Housing Corporation, Paul Casey and others, was that if we had had it stay the way it was, there would be even less affordable housing in, in downtown. That's what I'm hearing. So you probably had a different opinion. Um, that's what I'm hearing. Uh, that's what I've been told. And that's why I support what's going on right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate it. Kathy, then we'll get you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for coming on down to Elkridge. Of course. Uh, I was going to talk about CAC zoning and the need for no additional housing in that zoning unit mm -hmm. um, or in that category. Um, but hopefully you'll veto it if it comes to you and hopefully it won't even get to you. Mm -hmm. um, You're talking about the ZRA that's in front of the, the council. ZRA, yeah. right. Okay. Um, but something happened last week that has chilled me. Okay. Um, I got a phone call one night. It was a survey. Mm -hmm. Asked wonderful questions about what was happening in our county, um, you know, how I, w I felt about the people and jobs they were doing and okay. bag bills and stormwater. Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me, I think they use rain tax, but, mm -hmm. you know, the stormwater pollution tax. Mm -hmm. um, and then it said the last question was, and what is your name? Mm -hmm. And I, it just chilled me. And I said, I don't want to give you, I mean, this is, a, this is I thought, an anonymous survey. And they said, okay, um, let me just confirm, your phone number is, and, and they said my phone number. So now they have my answers, and they have a traceability. And then I find it's your committee that has come out mm -hmm. to do, that it came out with the poll. What are you going to do with this information? And can you assure me that that information will go nowhere? I, first of all, I guess I'm a little surprised here. I don't know of any poll that's done for those reasons that doesn't ask who they are first when they call. Because that's what you're, you're, you've got to do a sample. You can't get the right sample if you don't know who you're calling. Oh, oh they asked for, you know, who, you know, my age or what. No, you know, no the very first question have been your name. Because that's how they determine a sample. Because any polling, and everybody knows this, whether they're involved in politics or not, you've got to do polling. You've got to know how many, you want to make sure you have the right number of, uh, of women, the right number of Republicans, the right number of Democrats, the number of independents, all the ages. I mean, I have you, never been asked for my name. Well, I'm surprised because I think every poll does that. Every poll does I that. I have you, never. And you can always say no and just not participate. That's not an issue. Can, yeah. can you tell me what use that information will be used for? No, will it be, go down to the household? Of course, no, we don't. <laughs> of course, we're not going to go. It doesn't. I, I mean, I don't care about the person's name and who did it. It's a polling company. I don't get the people's name. I don't, when I see the results of a poll, no one comes back and says, you know, Joe Smith said this. I have no idea. It's the polling company, but they have to try to. They have to make sure they're talking to the right person before they can know their sample is correct. But yeah, so no, I, I have no idea who the individuals were who were sampled. Well, I, I would just. I mean, I will not yeah. answer another survey unless yeah. I know that it will remain anonymous. And that, that's fine. I'm just telling you, I don't think there's one political survey that could ever be that way because they got to know who they're talking to or they can't know their samples. Well, right. you know it's male, female. Well, how do you know that? 
Yeah. Well, that's, I'm being serious. Okay. That's, that's and, right. and, and I, I mean, don't mind if they yeah, had asked yeah. if I was male or female. Right. But they've got to know who you are because they won't know. That's how they determine the sample. You've got to know that because you have to understand. Because someone could just lie about their age. They could lie about whatever. But, I mean, that's, they have to know who the person they're talking to. But that's fine. But every, every campaign does that. I'm just telling you, it's not my campaign. Every campaign does that. Well, and, so, and then so. I guess I... What will yeah. you be doing with this information? Whatever campaign stuff, we, we have a poll to give information about what's going on in the community. But nothing about, we're not going to contact individuals about what they said or anything like that. That's, I don't even like to say, I don't even know who they are. Okay, thank you. Uh, and that's, I wanted to hear it from you. That's fine. To, to what you're, <laughs> yeah. Because I'm going to, yeah. I want to work with you. I of course. Just, it not, not meant to defend you at all, Kathy. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Drew. Hi, I'm Drew Roth. I'm president of the Greater Elk Ridge Community Association. Welcome yeah. to Elk Ridge. Thank you. Good and to be I here. have a souvenir for you. I found these right out front. These are all over our neighborhood. <laughs> Jim buys houses, Terry buys houses. And they're abundant in our neighborhood. I don't see one that says Drew buys houses. No, that, that's because I'm not in the business yeah. of buying houses from homeowners and flipping them into rental property investors. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that we see these all over our neighborhood, I think that Trudy and Jim know their business. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are a community that is in a state of vulnerability right now, and we're attracting these kind of predators, scaring people into getting out, and it is not to our benefit to have that happen. So why, is, why, why do you suppose they're doing this? Perhaps one reason is people who've lived here for decades now find airplanes flying overhead waking them up at night due to the next-gen flight patterns that have been put in place. Perhaps another reason is the overcrowded state of the schools and the lack of trust in the school system. That's the one I'd like to focus on. We've heard about the various issues of transparency about the school system. One I'd like to highlight is the lack of transparency in new school sites. Right? Howard High School, according to the feasibility studies the last two years, is currently severely overcrowded mm -hmm. and will be at 140% capacity in four years when my son enters high school. That's 600 students more than it can hold. That's down from 160% of capacity in the last feasibility study the year before. I don't know why it changed. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that you say we're working on this and we're working on a site. Can you tell me where the site is? I can't confirm where the site is, but we're working on a site. Because if we're not done a deal, I don't want to cause a problem. Is the site in Elkridge where the overcrowding situation is? The site's a long room one, but I can't tell you where it is. Okay, well, let me tell you this. There are rumors and floated out there that the site is off the Mission Road quarry site in Jessup. If that is, in fact, the site, that would not be acceptable for mm -hmm. Elkridge. I think you should look hard at the attendance areas mm -hmm. and ask yourself. I have 600 students in the Howard High School attendance area. If I build a school in Jessup, how do I redistrict? Because between here and Jessup, there's the Long Reach attendance area. Long Reach is at capacity. Are you going to bus our students in Elk Ridge who are currently overcrowded through the Long Reach attendance area to this new school in Jessup? Are you going to do a cascading redistrict where the students in Long Reach are going to get shifted to this new site in Jessup and then we get shifted into Long Reach? Why not build a school where the students live? Okay. Again, I mean, we're looking for a site. Uh, we don't build the schools and we don't. Uh, necessarily, we work sort of work with the school system on looking at the proper sites and what sites are available. A lot of it's what's available. And we had this discussion last year in the campaign, and right. I tell you, I can remember Drew like it was yesterday, pestering me, I want an Elk Ridge, I want an Elk Ridge. I said, I can't promise it's going to be an Elk Ridge. And I remember, I finally said, I think it was after the 10th time, I mm -hmm. said, I just can't do that. He goes, well, I knew if you did it, I'd get the opponent to do it too. But um, it didn't but we, work. Did it, it didn't work. It didn't work because I'm not going to until I, I can firmly say where it's going to be. But um, I have a site for you, by the way. I know. It might be Rockburn. But, um, it would be. Yeah. But I mean, the one thing I would tell you is I think redistricting is necessary anyway even with a new school. We just have to redistrict. I mean, we, you know, Zach's not here anymore, but, um, oh, is he back there? 
Oh, there he is. Uh, when I was at Elegant City Middle School, I went to sixth and seventh grade there. Eighth grade, I went to Hammond Middle School because it was built. That shows you how rural Howard County was at the time. I went from Elegant City to Laurel to change schools. But that's what redistricting you need to do sometimes. And I know it's hard for families when parents, when kids get redistricted, and I, I lived it. I had really good friends in sixth and seventh grade that end up not being my best friends probably. But what I always tell people is, one of the very best friends in my life I've ever met, I met in eighth grade at Hammond Middle School. And sometimes I think kids are much more resilient than their parents are. And so I think one of the issues is redistricting. Well, and, we ha and, and I think there are ways in which we could redistrict more and do, to do helping Howard in a more quickly fashion than building a new high school. So um, let, me, let me just suggest that, yeah. of course, redistricting is less burdensome if you're being redistricted to a school closer than the one you currently attend. And I understand that, but I mean, we also have to realize, as I said earlier, is we have certain budget constraints and we have to do what's best in the means of our taxpayers as well as our, our citizens and our, of our students and of our parents. And so we have to look at how we can make that happen. And, you know, folks run for school board are here, and I know Ellen Giles is here. I think one of the things you have to look at also is state funding. Because it's my understanding, it happened in Carroll County when I was a representative representing part of Har Har Carroll County, is they built a new high school up there when they couldn't show the need for it. Even though it was overcrowded in one area, they didn't want to necessarily redistrict to the rest of the areas. The state did not pay any money for that high school. They ended up paying the whole cost in Carroll County by itself. And a high school here is probably going to cost at least 80, 90 million dollars. And so we certainly couldn't afford to do that without the state help. So we have to make sure that we've done everything we can to avoid that, re that, that, that uh, overcrowding subject to building a high school. So, you know, I, my, my conversation to members of the board and Ms. Giles and others would be, we got to look at how we can do some redistricting to help alleviate problems now. And that's certainly, I don't want people selling their houses. I definitely don't want people being afraid to sell their house. I'm going to say, the yeah. vultures are out here. Yeah. Don't make us the roadkill from the developers. I don't want that to happen at all. But thank you, Drew. Thank you very much. And thank you for your leadership on GECA. And um, we'll continue to do whatever we can to make things better for everybody, not worse. Um, oh, gosh. I'm being bad. By the way, that's Diane Wilson, my chief of staff. Um, she's here as well. I just noticed that. And usually I give like a 15-minute warning, and I didn't. It's already after 8.30, and we generally stop at 8.30. But does anybody else have any questions before we finish? Because uh, I don't want to not have anyone be able to say something. Um, yes, sir. Go ahead. I, um, Howard County resident since 1963. Um, I did want to bring up the issue of traffic, which was already brought up earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that sounds like a light might be coming to the Blue Stream development. I would say it's coming. We're trying. We're trying. Working. Yeah. Okay. And um, hopefully the Montevideo Road thing will get mm -hmm. straightened out. Mm -hmm. um, but that, uh, again, I've been here my whole life, and mm -hmm. traffic continually gets worse. And I know you're limited in what you can do. Uh, but you know, it is getting tighter, it's getting more gridlock, which also affects the schools. Um, I don't know how my kids, my daughter gets a long reach in the morning, it's as backed up as 100 is. Uh, but that's, I'm hoping that's, I know there's a lot on your plate, I appreciate a lot of things you've done, I appreciate yeah. you getting the funding to move towards a high school site. Um, and I just hope we can work with that, but also with the state delegation, Route 1 needs some safety improvements. Um, you know, that. Railroad Bridge in Elkridge is still one of my nemesis. Is it uh, took out my windshield a few weeks ago? I was driving under and a rock came down. Really? Yeah. So uh, it's, but it's, it's also very narrow. So it's it and it floods. Um, there's a number of issues along Route One. They really could use some safety upgrades, okay. and uh, which also would probably help with a lot of other things as far as helping beautify the road if you can improve the. Uh, but that, I know that's the state. That's not you. But you but however you have contacts in Annapolis, you have friends in high places. So. Uh, just like hope, hope Garth Brooks. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, <laughs> Just hoping yeah. you keep that on your plate as well. But also, like Drew, I've got a child who's in uh, fifth grade, and you know she's going to high school in a couple of years. And from what I'm reading, the uh, new high school will be ready about the time she's in her junior year of college. So mm -hmm. that's really not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And again, I've been here my whole life, and I think things were. You know, of course, it was smaller in the past. It was easier to run things in the past, but these problems didn't sneak up on us. No. no this is right. this has been coming for a long time. Um, right. And there's a lot of bad choices been made by our school board. For instance, this piece of land, this piece of land was bought in the 50s, was then sold as surplus, and then had to turn around and buy it back for a school when we got in a pinch. And I just 
really hate the lack of long-term planning on the school board. School board. They're all, all fair points, and thank you for sharing with me. Right. And, and we are doing the best we can. Um, right. I certainly have a long-range perspective here, too, because okay. my daughter's a teacher in Howard County, and I want my children to be able to live here and, and grow here and, and enjoy it like we all have. So. Okay. All right, thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out. We will certainly have at least three more of these this year. Um, I appreciate your willingness. As I said earlier, I think listening to you makes a difference, helps me understand what we need to do and how we can better help everybody. So thanks for coming out. Again, there are a lot of folks here run for school board. Feel free to talk to them, uh, like Judy suggests and others. So thank you very much. Have a good evening.